Praise God. We are so thankful to be here and so thankful that we can uh, spend time with you and spend time sharing the gospel and, and uh, the word of God and, and how God is working in our lives, sharing testimonies and and all the wonderful ways, all the wonderful things that God has done, the blessings he's brought in our lives. And we can share that with each other. And that's what this radio station is all about. We pray that you had a good evening. Yesterday, we had a guest, uh, Ganev Gregor, and he gave a powerful testimony about how God brought him through to where he was finally able to have the scales off his eyes and have clearer vision of what God was expecting from him today, even to the point to where he's out in the country now doing um, wonderful work for the Lord. So uh, we thank God uh, for what happened yesterday. But even today, we have another treat for you. We're going to talk to uh, Brother Simeon Joseph. But before we do, let us have a word of prayer. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you so much for your love and for your grace. Thank you so much for trusting us with the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, sin, as, as sinful as we are. But help us not to remain in this state. Help us to make the decision today to let go of the distractions and the sin in our lives and to keep our, life, our eyes focused on Jesus Christ, the only one to get us through. So, Father, please help us to make that our endeavor and our goal today in a very special way. Forgive us for our sins and bless us this hour as we chat. Bless Brother brother Simeon, bless myself and those who are listening. And we thank you so much in Jesus' name. Amen. On the line with us right now is Brother Simeon Joseph. Brother Simeon, how are you? I'm doing fine, my brother. How about you? I am blessed. I am blessed. Okay, so you sent me an article this past weekend. So you you basically sent it to me almost as it was happening. I, I mean, soon after it happened. Share with us what happened over in Rwanda. Well, in the article, I mean, prior to that, matter of fact, uh, let me let me let me um hit you with this. Two weeks um prior to this incident that happened Saturday at midday, it was a big uproar. In Yawanda, we're closing down 700 churches in Yawanda. And then two weeks later, today, you can say not today, but um, Saturday at midday, um, a light land, you could say it was, what, or, um, blue skies, you know, clouds out there, sunny day. Um, yeah. Out of nowhere, a light land just struck a Seventh-day Adventist church and killed 17 people. Okay, so let's back up. Let's go back to two weeks ago because I didn't even realize that. Didn't even know that. Share again what happened two weeks prior to this incident. Well, two weeks ago, they were. It was a big, not gonna say a protest, but an uproar, um, because right now in Yowanda, uh, they shut down seven hundred Protestant Christian church in Yowanda, and right now people have nowhere to worship, nowhere to go to church. Um, right now they have to stay home and have church and worship. And that right there, it must really hit us to see what is coming soon and very soon for God's people. No doubt about it. Now, you may not have all the information right now, so I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. If we can do more research as to, I mean, who did the shutdown and why and who was involved? And I mean, because this is very interesting. I didn't even know that this happened two weeks prior to this lightning strike. You know, okay, so. Okay. Yeah, if we can look into it, that would be that, that would be great. I, I do have an article in front of me of what happened on Sabbath. It says a lightning strike killed at least sixteen people and injured dozens more at a Seventh Day Adventist Church in Rwanda on Saturday. Most of the victims died instantly when lightning hit the church in the southern district of Nairunguru, and uh, the local mayor said, mm -hmm. and it's, and um. And then it goes on. There's more, there's more to the, there's a short article, but, and then they were buried on Sunday, a day later, in wooden coffins. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, mm -hmm. No, go ahead. Yeah, because the article that I sent you, it says about the uh, closure of more than 700 churches in Rwanda. 
Um, it says failing to comply with building regulation and for noise pollution population. So uh, that's what it said in the, in the same article about the lightning struck that hit the Seven Adventist Church. So I definitely have to do all more research on that part. Yeah, right there. that is what you're telling me is deep. For so that, that to go on, in. and then two weeks later, a lightning strike? A lightning strike. And, and then, then people, people died? Midday. Mid right now it says at least 16 people dead and 140 injured. It says, it says only a single lightning hit the church. And I was like, mercy. Have mercy. And I'm at the point now where I really believe in coincidence or by, you know, this, by, this by chance thing. This is kind of deep. So I, I would like to learn more about this whole situation. Oh, yeah. And, um, you have another s s article that you wanted to share. Yeah, this article I want to share is on um, <clears throat> what is taking place right now in Venezuela. And most of us are, are, are probably hearing about Venezuela since last year uh, or two years ago when the economy, because, you know, Venezuela is a country that was rich in oil. And then next thing you know, oil just gone, economy went down, and here come a crisis. Mm -hmm. And um, every month, every day, every hour, it's getting worse over there. And I remember when I read uh, one of the chapters from Ellen G. White, when she mentioned about Jerusalem of old and how this world is going to become like the besiege of Jerusalem of old, mm. I can really see the same thing is going on in Venezuela because there's no food coming in, no medicine coming in, no treatment coming in. These soldiers are patrolling the, the ports where a ship comes in with an item, and now people have to go in the zoo to kill horses and kill animals, even kill their own pet to survive. Mercy. And that is the same thing that happened, you could say, in Jerusalem of old when they were besieged. You know? Exactly. And That's exactly what happened. Has to be, yes, yes. You know, so, I mean, if you, take, if you really look at this the article and picture in your mind, you could see that we're not too far for what is coming in this world. It's not too yes. far, even for us. Yes, yes. And God is trying to get people to open up their eyes and start living for heaven now instead of trying to live for this earth. Things of this earth. You know, I, I heard, I heard someone say, uh, a couple of weeks ago, you know, he said, I've never seen a U-Haul behind a hearse. But meaning mm -hmm. you can't take things of this world with you to the grave. Oh, yeah. And, and, and so, you know, so we need to start living for heaven and stop living for this place and see what's going on and be ready. Noah was ready. When, when, and let me tell you, when that storm came in Noah's, Noah's day, it didn't, you know, it, the skies were, were beautiful. The place, it, it, it didn't seem possible by the inhabitants that were on the earth at the time. But Noah, God told Noah to get ready and he got ready. So, oh, yes. And, and, and I, yes. And, and I definitely agree with you, sir. I, I definitely agree with you because, um, you know, right now we live in a dangerous time. Uh, we really live in a dangerous time, and, and God is speaking to us. We, we can see the hand written on the wall. Every day, God, God is showing us signs that he's near. And the main thing yes. is that, you know, even for Noah, like you said, my brother, he had to prepare himself by faith. You know, yes. he had to meet God every day. It wasn't easy for Noah and his generation, especially in our generation right now. Because, you know, one thing I realized, you know, when you read um, Daniel chapter 12, when it said that Michael's going to stand up, you see, the thing is that mm. we all know that Jesus is going to stand up, but it doesn't happen like that that he's going to stand up and close probation. We have to understand that when this sealing angel comes back to heaven and tell Jesus that every case is decided for life and death, that's when Michael stand up. And that is mm. a serious time when that sealing angel comes back. So right now, God is being merciful. He's shown us, he's talking to us, that we must study his word understand his word and live by faith. And like Ellen White says in a book on early writings, ch uh, Mark, the chapter of Mark of the Beast, she said this, her company angel approached her and said that time is short. And Ellen White says, do we reflect the lovely image of Jesus in us? Mm. And we know that time is short. All of it, we, right. we must see that time is short. But do we reflect the character, the image of Jesus in us? And that's what Jesus went on. He's waiting on us. He's waiting on us. So, yes, that's he's waiting right. on us. 
that sealing angel you're talking about, I guess that's Revelation 18. Um, what I, I would like to do at some point is, you know, you and I, let's get on the air and let's, uh, let's, let's do a Bible study because not just for you and I, but everyone who's listening, we need to understand the Bible, what it's saying. We need to get deeper, deeper and deeper into the Bible and know where things are. So when we're talking to people, we can just open up our Bibles and go to it. And, um, and, and another thing, and let me say this, and you're going to hear me say this more in the future because this is, this is important. We need to let, in fact, let me pick up my Bible now. I have the Bible in my hand now. This, this book needs to be the final authority. Let me say that because in this last, in these last days, you have people coming up with all types of strange doctrine. Mm-hmm. And, and Simeon, the, the doctrine that they're coming up with, is based on the Bible, yes. but not but not founded on the Bible. <laughs> See, even even the enemy used the Bible to tempt Christ. Indeed. So it'd be based on the Bible. They will take scripture out of it, but it is not founded. Now, what do I mean by that? When we read the word of God, let the Bible explain itself, because a lot of um, Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses and so forth will speak to you and say, well, you have all these different religions because they have their and their own personal interpretations. I agree, they do. Everyone does have their own personal interpretation. But the interpretation that we need to have is the Bible alone. I don't need to have my own personal interpretation. Sure. No vain interpretation like that. Don't want to go there. Want to stick strictly to what the Bible said. If the Bible says, the seventh day, the Sabbath, the Lord thy God, in it thou shalt not do any work. The Bible said it. I don't need to, but someone else will come along and take that same verse and have come with their own interpretation of why you don't have to keep the seventh day. Oh, yes. No. What the Bible says, and it alone, solo scriptura, and let the Bible speak for itself. So, so what I, it, yeah, and then so what you and I can do, you know, we can get on the air and we can dig deeper into the Bible and tell everyone, get your Bibles out, get your highlighters out. Know where these verses are so you know can, you can flip through it and pull it up when you need it. And start memorizing them too, but at least know where they are. Indeed. Amen? Indeed. And how the, Bible work, how the Bible goes line upon line and precept upon precept. Amen. Um, Amen. Now, I'm going to bring up another article here real quick that you probably don't even know about. But I'm, the reason why I'm going to bring it up, because we're going to talk about your story in a minute. And your story actually happened over in Nepal. Is that you were in Nepal, correct? Yes, I was in Nepal. Okay, well, I have, this is from, this happened, I guess, yesterday, Monday. It says, a plane carrying 71 passengers and crew has crashed on landing at Nepal's, Nepal's Kathmandu Airport. Kathmandu, Kathmandu, Kathmandu Airport. Now, I don't know if, how many airports they have, um, but this one killed 49 people, according to police. Mercy. And rescued, rescuers pulled bodies from the charred wreckage of the plane operated by the Bangladesh airline uh, after a raging fire was put out. So this happened in Nepal, killing almost 50 people. And we're going to talk to you, talk to you right now because you went to Nepal to do a mission trip. Is that correct? Yes, I was there um, to do a mission trip. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's, let's talk about that right now. And so we could um, be blessed by your story. You went to Nepal. To do a, now, did you go by yourself, or did you go with a group or a team? Well, I went with um a a, a team, uh, the, a brother of mine, and um a spiritual brother of mine, his wife. Uh, we went over there. Uh, a dear sister invited us uh, to come to Nepal. Okay, and how long were you there? I was there like for two weeks. Okay, and. Before we go, you you have an interesting story about what happened. You know, something happened to you when you left Nepal, but we won't go there quite yet. While you were in Nepal, how was how was that experience? Man, I mean, it was a, tr- a, a truly a blessing by God. 
um, going to a country in the Middle East, uh, you could say <clears throat> that is 99% uh, Hindu and, and, and Buddhist over there. I could say Buddhist, you could say 90% Buddhist and probably like uh, 60% or 50% Hindu and 1% Christian, Christianity over there. But um, it was a wonderful experience. Um, you know, when I went there, I was there when they had, well, the, the, uh, um, the, the following year, um, that's when the earthquake hit them, uh, the 7 point, I think it was 7.3, 7.5 earthquake that hit Kathmandu, the capital of Nepal. Mm-hmm. So when I arrived there, I really see the uh, catastrophic and um, the destruction of these buildings. And it was really sad. You know, it, it was like a, a, a country drop a bomb in the capital. It was really uh, serious and scarce. Um, but the Christians over there, the 1% of Christians, they were happy to receive the message. Um, it was truly a blessing, uh, to share the good news because you see in certain countries like the Middle East or in Asia, they love testimonies. They love to hear what God has done for you or what miracle that God had intervened. And, and they love that because it gives them hope. You understand? You know, most of the people that are literate, they can't read the Bible. They can't read their own language. But when they hear testimony, it gives them hope. It gives them like, it's like a new, a, a new food to them. And they're so excited, and they trust in God to go forward. So, you know, while I was there, you know, I shared my testimony. We had a, a, a crusade. Um, nothing but Christian and uh, Christians. People came out, Buddhist, Hindu. And um, they hear they the message, and they loved it. And, and like three to four people uh, give their life to the Lord. And it was wonderful, a wonderful experience. Um, I could tell you this. Going did, there, you have any, did you have any Buddhists or Hindus give their life to the Lord? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, really? Uh, yes, three Hindu and one Buddhist give their life to the Lord. Okay. And, and the funny part about that, they travel because Nepal is right next door to India, Bangladesh, and China. It's like in the middle. And mm-hmm. these three people, these four people came from India. They heard about the crusade, and they travel miles and miles, hundreds of miles on the bus to attend this crusade in Nepal. Have mercy. See, and I, I asked the question because you can have Christians recommit their lives to God. Mm-hmm. But, boy, if you're in a country with that many <laughs> Buddhists and and Hindu, that has to be an experience. And to see them come to Christ is even more beautiful. But that has oh, to be yes. something. Yeah. Um, oh, yes. You guys didn't go door to door or anything like that, though, right? Yes, we, we went door to door. We visited people. Um, we had Bible study with them, uh, most of the Christians that were suffering because, you know, the economy over there is real bad. Um, most of the husbands, they have to leave their wives and kids and go to, like, Dubai and these countries to work, to provide for the family. And sometimes not even easy over there, too. They're not getting paid. So we had to encourage the family to trust in God, and, and God will provide the way. So we went door to door um, in certain villages and certain neighborhoods and shared the gospel. And people were happy. They were so happy because, like I said, that following year, I mean, uh, a year later, um, prior to me be arriving there, they got hit with a 7.5 earthquake. Some of them lost their kids, their husband. And it was sad to hear their testimony. But but to hear us sharing the good news of Jesus, you can see smile in their face. You can see them, you know, sharing tears because it's like hope. They're searching for hope. You know, they're searching for something that could give them the strength every day. So that was a blessing from the Lord. Before we get to what happened when you left the country, how was your accommodations? Where did you stay and what was that like in case people are thinking about doing mission trips themselves out there? Where did you stay? We were staying in a slump. Uh, in Kathmandu, up in the hills, there was a slump. Um, I was staying in an orphanage, a five-store orphanage, uh, with Christian young kids, and it, it was beautiful. It was wonderful. Um, the combination was a blessing. You know, these kids over there, they called me Uncle Sam. They took me in as their brother, and, you know, and, and they loved the Lord over there. And, and I could see the, the, the guy who owns the orphanage, he taught them about Jesus, how to pray, how to call upon Jesus, because these orphanage kids, they lost their parents. Uh, from the earthquake, and some of the parents they couldn't mercy. provide for them, so My. it was it was truly a blessing for me to be there and share the good news to this young generation that going to carry the message 
that's going to spark the message there in Nepal. So it was a blessing. But I could say one thing. Mm -hmm. Going to these, you could call third world country is not easy. Um, mm -hmm. If you're not ready to really learn how to sleep in the ground or sleep on a bed that is made out of wood um, with no AC, no electricity. When I was there, there was no electricity <clears throat> at all. You know, it, it, a dusty country, a lot of dust, hot, um, mosquitoes, <clears throat> um, pitch black. You can't go outside a certain time. And in this country, they open the door for sin. I mean, when I mean open the door for Satan, Satan, the, 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 the evil angels are there. You could see these images of, okay, and over there is about 300 gods they worship in Nepal. 300 million gods they worship in Nepal. And every house that you pass by, every building is a statue or image of their god. And... Being there, I can share this testimony with you guys. Um, I remember one night, um, my room was in the basement. I'm mean, not the basement, the first floor. And um, my room is right near to the road. So while I was there sleeping, I think it was like 1 o'clock in the morning, I was hearing a sonic blast. I was going down the, uh, the road. And I was saying to myself, what is going on? Because that blast was so powerful, I felt the wind going inside my room. So I was saying to myself, hey, the electricity is back on. The AC is running. When I got up, I was like, what is this sound? Nobody can really drive so quick on this road because it's a narrow road, potholes, and rock. So when people drive, matter of fact, they don't drive on the road. You have to get on your bicycle and paddle. So I was saying to myself, what is this? Is a nation, another nation, send the army or jet to, to bomb this, uh, uh, this capital? What, what is going on? So I got on my knees and I started praying because I realized that the enemy is here because this is nothing but a Hindu country that worship images of false God. So I was on my knees. I prayed and I said, Lord, send the mighty angels to protect me while I'm here. Protect me, Lord. So after I finished praying, I went on my bed and I heard the sonic blast again. Like someone was speeding up the road. And I woke up my eyes and I said, have mercy, Lord. Please send mighty angels. Please send mighty angels to protect me. And next thing you know, right near my window, it's like I could hear somebody laughing with a deep voice. And I was saying to myself, you know, who's out there playing games or trying to scare me? But I realized nobody's out there because it's pitch black. So the next thing you know, after that laugh, hello? Um, go ahead. We are deeply listening. Yeah. So after I hear that, um, that laughter voice disappear, here come like a wolf was howling in the window. So I'm like, what is going on? I said, who's out there playing games with me? I got to stop it. But nobody was out there. So next thing you know, I, I, I went on my knees again. I prayed. I said, Lord, please send mighty angels. Protect me. Protect this building. <clears throat> I went on my bed. Next thing you know, I'm hearing bells ringing because there's a temple right next door to the, uh, the place, the temple that they come and worship their God. And the temple was, um, um, the bell was ringing and ringing and ringing. Next thing you know, I'm hearing dogs barking and barking and barking. I'm like, yo, it's 1 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock in the morning. What is going on? But next thing you know, the Lord just protected me and, you know, went to sleep. And when I woke up the next day, I went upstairs. I talked to the brother. I said, like, listen, man, did you hear that sonic blast? He was like, no. Did you hear the dog barking? He was like, yeah, man, so many dogs were barking. What's going on? I said, I don't know. Next thing you know, a Nepalese brother was there. I explained to him the situation. He was like, yeah, brother, what your experience was, these dogs could sense demon that is walking up and down the road. And that was demon that was ringing the temple bell. And I said, mercy. Mm. I said, no wonder when I felt that sonic blast that was going up and down the road, it was <clears throat> demon. Evil spirit was there in that country. These are the gods that they worship. So that was one of the experiences I, I, I experienced over there. And I'm telling you, that, that, that would have scared me to the point. I said, you know what? Take me to the airport. I want to go back home. <laughs> well, you know, to go to these countries, you really have to fast and pray that God could protect you. Yeah, it, it, yeah. Was, it was real serious, man. I mean, no electricity. You have thieves on the road, gangsters on the road. You're in a slump. And only God could protect you. But God was just showing me and say, hey, 
these type of work, that's what's going to happen when you visit these countries that allowed Satan to come in with all these false images and God. So it was a wonderful experience that Lord was, the Lord was teaching me that whenever I go overseas, I'm prepared and that my mind is focused because I know that I'm an enemy ground and turf. Brother Simeon, I, I didn't ask you this before. Are, are you single? Yes. Okay. So when you were away, you didn't have to call home to your wife, but did you, were you able to contact your family at, at um, yes, time? um, they, they, yeah, they had a wife. Well, um, no, 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 I couldn't contact nobody. I don't think, no, I couldn't contact nobody over there because, um, they had Wi-Fi during that time. I think one of the days, uh, the electricity came back on, but it was, off. it was very, um, so the Wi-Fi was working a little bit, but it was so weak. So I couldn't contact nobody overseas. And the reason why you went, you wanted to have the missionary experience? Well, because um, the lady invited me because she knows that the young people co interact with young people. <clears throat> There's a lot of young people over there in Nepal that are searching for the truth. You know what I mean? And okay. when I spoke to these okay. young people in the orphanage, it was, so, it was a blessing that one of the brothers came to me and said, hey, how can I witness to my friends in school that are Hindu and Buddhist? And I could see that the Lord did really want me and the brother to be there to talk to these young people, to encourage them. Because like I said, I don't live in that country, but like the Bible says, we must baptize, make disciples. So these young people are disciples for the Lord and for the Holy Spirit using me to talk to them and to encourage them to go forward. That was truly a blessing. Amen. All right, so let me ask you this question. Um, mm -hmm. Well, before I, again, before we go to you leaving the country, how, the food, I mean, what did you eat? What did they feed you? And how was that? Well, over there, I mean, in Nepal, the way we eat in America by using a spoon and a fork, over there they use their hands. And that was their culture. And, you know, over there I was like, um, can I borrow a spoon or a fork? Because, you know, <laughs> it's not really, it's like, because, you know, after they got hit with an earthquake, it was not a lot of, it's sanitized over there. You know what I mean? It's not a lot of sanitizing mm -hmm. thing to keep your hand on wash and, you know, cut off the germs. So it was kind of hard. But every day you have to eat rice and, and um, some type of um, spinach they had and beans every day. But it was a good. It was a blessing. Um, in the morning, is always uh, tea you had to drink, and they made a thing called mumus. is a is, is the best whatever best thing I've ate called mumus. I had vegetar um vegetables in there, and it's, it's sort of like a patty, but it, they boil it, and that was a good thing that I ate over there. But um, you know, but it, it was good. The food was good. It was good, and I lost a couple of weights. So uh, uh, I lost a lot of weight over there, going up the <laughs> stairs and going down yeah. the mountains, taking the kids to school. But it was a blessing. The food was good. Um, it, they had some nice papaya, fruits and vegetables. Was a blessing. No GMOs. It was straight from the farm. Mm -hmm. It was good. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> it was yeah, wonderful. Yeah. That's true. Well, yeah, some of these third world countries. But let, let me say this about the third world country, though. I tend to believe that when the final crisis comes on this earth. Now, just follow me. And you may have experienced this. I don't know. But I tend to believe that a lot of these third world countries are better prepared to handle the crisis that is coming than countries like America or any other first world country because America doesn't know how to live like a third world country when things go bad. Um, These people the are used is, to it. Yes. I, I could say um, yes, or I could say no, but I, I agree with you. But um, I could say, and like in this generation, most of these kids are living in the cities in these countries. So they're not used to living in a country. But at the end of the day, yes, they can survive because they've been through it with a hardship, you know, economy bad, and losing all this. And, and the funny part, you know, it's funny you said that because even me watching these kids, the shoes and the clothes they have, they seem so happy. And I'm like, man, well, it, that's it was my a point. lesson learned for me too. Yes. Come again? No, that's my point. I agree with you. Even when you yeah. make the, the, the point about uh, not having a spoon. I mean, you take someone in a first world country and you're down, you know, you're being treated like nothing, like garbage. And, you know, and, and you take away electricity, 
you take away air conditioning, you take away food. I mean, you, I mean, people start. The, here's the point: people in first world countries, to me, start to panic, whereas people in third world countries may not panic so quickly because they're used to it. You know, they use. Mm-hmm. So, um, well, listen, let's let's. Your story is interesting, and but it but it gets more interesting because it's almost time for you to leave now, or you are. It is time for you to leave, and you're you're packing and you're getting ready to go to the airport. And I think your ticket is going to take you from Nepal to Dubai. Dubai. Yeah, Dubai. Dubai. I'm saying that wrong. Okay. Yes. And from Dubai to the United States. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Um. You know, when I left, um, when I got my boarding pass, it was from leaving Kathmandu, the um, Nepal, Nepal to Dubai, and Dubai to Boston, Massachusetts, and Boston to Florida, where I reside right now. Okay. <clears throat> so, when I left Nepal and I arrived in Dubai, I think it was like early in the morning, probably like two or three o'clock in the morning. I can say one o'clock in the morning. Um, I went to the to the desk to show um, to show the people my other boarding pass um, for me to go to the gate to leave here to go to the state. So no, no, no. There, now, brother Simeon, you are traveling alone. Yes, that, yes, I was traveling alone. Yes, traveling okay. alone. Okay, mm-hmm. go ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yes, I was traveling alone. Even when I was going to Nepal, I was traveling alone, but traveling back, same thing. So both ways, I was traveling alone. So, yes, arriving to Dubai, you know, I got there, went up to the desk. It was my turn to show them my passport, my boarding pass. And then, next thing you know, <clears throat> the gentleman looked at my boarding pass and said, um, you're not supposed to be here. Your ticket expired. I said, what do you mean, my ticket expired? I said, what, I said, what do you mean I'm not supposed to be here? He said, oh, I'm not supposed to be here at the bar. I said, what do you mean? So I went on my phone and I showed him my boarding pass on my phone. I said, look, my brother, I said, here. It says Nepal to Dubai, Dubai to Boston, Boston to Florida. He said, not in this computer. And I was like, what do you mean? What is going <laughs> oh, on? Brother. You know? Oh, my. So, yeah. So he was like, you know what? Go down the street. Go talk to these people. They will help you. So I had to take a bus. Try, because, you know, um, Dubai is a, is a big airport. You know, mm-hmm. Dubai is a massive airport. It's real massive. Mm-hmm. So, <clears throat> so when I got on the bus, I got to my destination. I got off. My heart was beating because I'm like another thousand thousand miles away. And I said, Lord, please help me. Let this thing work. Be with the people that they could see what's going on and what's happening. So, I got there, and it was these two ladies that was working on the front desk. They took my boarding pass. I explained to them my situation. <clears throat> and next thing you know. Then he looked at me and said, yes, I'm sorry. Your ticket is expired. We can't help you. I said, what do you mean? Just like that? And I said, so, I, I mean, what, what do you want me to do? I mean, you have to work something. I mean, well, I, I mean, it was, I mean, like my heart was beating. I was like, what do you mean my ticket is expired? You're not going to do anything? They said, we can't help you. You're not supposed to be here. You're supposed to be in immigrant um, country, not here. Did, said, did they like, explain what an expired ticket is? I've never even heard of that. If, if you bought a ticket, mm-hmm. how does your ticket, ticket expire? <laughs> um, especially well, I, if it's I'm like two weeks you, later. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah I'm going to tell you how it was expired. So <clears throat> after um, after that, you know, to that state, I was like, oh my goodness, I'm stuck here in Dubai. I don't know what to do. All right, let's let's go back. To, let's go over some of the details. The two ladies tell you that the ticket is, is expired, it's and expired. you don't know. Right, you don't know what you're gonna you're gonna do. So where did you go from there? So I I, I was like, I said the ticket expired. I said, what, what what shall I do? So next thing you know, I walked away and I and I, I spoke to another guy, and he said the only thing you could do is go buy a phone card, call America, and, and he told me which airline did you leave America to come here two weeks ago. I said, JetBlue. He said, call America. Spoke to, speak to JetBlue. I said, I said to him, buy a phone card. I said, brother, phone card even lasts for, what, 20 minutes or 30 <laughs> minutes. I said, call him JetBlue? You don't have to go through? He said, that's, that's, that's all you could do. So next thing you know, I was like, all right, let me buy me a phone card. And when I saw the price for a phone card, I said, I couldn't believe it. $20 American for a phone card. Mm. A phone card. 
So right mm-hmm. there, <clears throat> I started praying. I started praying. I said, Lord, you got to help me. What is going on? What is going on? So next thing you know, I bought me the phone card. I went up to the telephone booth. And this phone call is a chip that you put in there. And then you type in the password. So I put in the, the phone card in there. I typed in the password. I'm about to call JetBlue. The password says it expired. I said, what is going on? Mm. <laughs> so I said, all right, this, this phone booth is not working. So I went to the next phone booth. It said the same thing. I went to the next phone booth. It said the same thing. I said, what is going on? I said, no, what is this? Is this a joke? So I walk another block down to use another phone booth. None of it working. None of the password wasn't working. At so that time, my brother, the only thing I could do is pray to God. And that's when <laughs> I couldn't describe it. It's like my heart drop. And I said, man, it's only God can help me. Only you can help me, Lord. And I prayed and I shed tears. I cried. I prayed. I said, Lord, what is going on? The Wi-Fi is weak over here. I couldn't use WhatsApp. I couldn't use anything. I spent two days there in the airport. So wait, tell us what you said. <laughs> you spent two days. Listen, listen. So you, all right, you're crying tears, whatever, and you have to find a place to sleep. Eat. I mean, did you get something to eat? No. It's like two days of fasting. I only thing I do was one day I couldn't even sleep. I'm because, like I said, Dubai is a massive airport, it's like three floors. I'm up and down, up and down, trying to do something. To, matter of fact, I was just praying to God the whole time. It came to the point that I was saying to myself when the Lord had intervened. I said, "Man, this got to be in the Bible. <laughs> if the Bible is continue to be written, because." It's like I broke the Guinness World Record of prayer. I prayed every second, (laughs) every point second. I mean, every second. Every time I said amen, I prayed again. Amen, I prayed again. With tears in my eyes. No food, no anything. My stomach was killing me. It was beating me up. Did you fast because of your financial situation? No, what I mean fasting is that I didn't eat anything. It was like a fast. I, well, I mean, I understand that, but was that a, a decided decision because of what was going on or because you yes, didn't have yes, money? Yes, mm-hmm. They had money. Not only, not, yeah, Did you have money? money? I mean, I had Nepalese money, but the buy is so expensive. Right. I, mean, I, I, did, I did. I, I did have like what? Probably like, or, uh, uh, I, I did have money because I bought the phone card. But after, okay, after them two days, I'm agonizing with the Lord. I mean, it's like to the point that I lost weight, my brother. I was so skinny. <laughs> and it came to the point that I said, you know what? I'm going to the bathroom. I'm going to wash myself. I'm going to pray in there. And it was so funny because when I walked to the bathroom, it was two restrooms. It said one for the Muslim and one for the regular people. I said, man, what's no way. going on in here? Yes. They when have I'm a Muslim, Muslim bathroom? Yes, a Muslim bathroom where you could go, pray in there, use the restroom, and get out. And to the point, people thought I was Muslim because the reason why I said that, because when I was in Nepal, I brought me one of these, um, the gowns that they have for men. Because, you know, I brought something from another country, you know? So mm-hmm. when, I, when I put on the gown to leave the country, every time I prayed, I get on my knees in the airport. Well, thousands of people went up and down, walking up and down. I got on my knees, I prayed, I get back up. I got on my knees and pray, I get back up. So people were like, man, who's this guy? A Muslim or something? This is something strange. He's not prostrated, but he's praying to get back up. Because I didn't care if people was passing by me. I was in a crisis. You know, for two days, no food. You know, I could have been begged people because they don't even speak my language. I mean, some do, but I didn't want to beg. You know, I'm agonizing with the Lord. I'm praying with tears in my eyes. So, after that second day, the Lord spoke to me and said, go back to the desk. And the Lord just sent me to one of the desks where the people worked at. So it was two gentlemen working there. It was, I think it was, um, no, it wasn't Jeb, but it was some type of airline. I approached them. I said, brothers, listen, I'm in a crisis right now. I need your help. I was supposed to leave two days ago, but they said my ticket got suspended. I don't know what's going on. So I gave them my old, my old boarding pass. They looked at it. And the brother said, all right, I'm going to help you. And this brother spent an hour trying to figure out what is going on. So he asked me a question. He said, let me ask you a question. Were you supposed to leave America Tuesday? 
I said, yes, I was supposed to leave America Tuesday, but something happened. It canceled the flight. So I had to leave Wednesday. He said, oh, I see. He said, all right, go next door there to take care of you. I said, you sure? He said, yes. I said, okay. So I took the ticket. I went next door. And it was females. I was walking in the front desk. I said, okay, Lord, please help me. I don't know if these females are having a bad day, but please help me, Lord, that they can help me get me a new boarding pass that could leave this country. So three females, uh, two Caucasian, one black, and the Lord sent me to the, one of the Caucasian ladies. So I approached her. I explained to her my situation. And for her, it took her like an hour and, and 40 minutes. You could say hour 30 or 40 minutes. And every time I'm, I'm looking at her to see, is she progressing? Every time she get on the phone, I prayed. She typed, I prayed. And I could, I, could, I could look at her face reaction like something's happened bad, like this is not going to work. And I keep praying, I keep praying. And not only that, the Lord permit me to be on the line by myself. There was nobody behind me. So that was a blessing from the Lord. So I was there by myself mm-hmm. in line, waiting for this lady to help me. After that hour, 30 or 40 minutes were done, she said, I got you. Got it. I said, what do you mean? She said, I got you new boarding pass. I got you new flight. And I said, praise God. She gave me uh, the new boarding pass. She gave me my old boarding pass. She said, I'm leaving this day. The gate is over there. You know, have a good day. I was so happy. Like, I want to just jump across and give her a hug. But I give the Lord praise. <laughs> I'm telling you, brother, I was rejoicing. <laughs> I was rejoicing. So... After that, um, I went to my gate, I sat down, I gave the Lord praise, and then I started thinking, I said, Lord, what happened? I said, what happened, Lord? Why, why did you have me here for two days, you know? I was just agonizing the Lord. So anyhow, I was just fixing up my wallet and my boarding pass in my pocket, and I was hungry, so hungry. My stomach was killing me. And then I'm in a conversation, loud and clear. It was an African brother adjacent from him is two, like, you could say, they probably could be Pakistani or Indian or whatever, but they were, um, these Asian people or Middle Eastern people. So <clears throat> he, was talk- he was talking to them, and um, I'm overhearing the conversation, and the brother was like, the African brother was like, you know, I went to use the restroom. I left my carry-on luggage here in a bag, and when I got back, it disappeared. And so he's crying, he's, he's crying out to these two brothers for help. They don't know what to do. So the only thing these two Middle Eastern um, brothers said to him, they just schooled him and said, you know, you're not from this country. You can't leave this stuff squandering like that. It doesn't make any sense. And I did agree with them because, you know, you're here for a connect flight. You just can't leave this stuff like that carelessly. So I agree with them. And next thing you know, they got up and just left the brother. <laughs> they couldn't do anything. So <laughs> while I was there, I was saying to myself, all right, Lord, how can I help this brother? How can I help him, Lord? Um, so I looked over, and he looked at me. And I said, hey, how you doing, my brother? He said, I'm doing fine. I said, where are you from? He said, I'm from um, Nigeria, Africa. He said, I'm going home to visit my family. I said, okay, cool. That's nice. African brother. And then he said, brother, I need your help. I said, what is it? He said, man, I'm sitting right here. Next to me was my carry-on luggage with my important documents. I had my passport in there. I had my boarding pass in there. I had everything in here. And I went to use the restroom, and I got back. It was gone. So I said, who was sitting next to you? He said, it was two Caucasian people, and they were gone too. And I said, brother, well, let me tell you this. You did make a big mistake, you know. You can't leave your stuff like that carelessly, so that's a big mistake. But did you talk to the police? He said, no, I don't know what to do. So then... And the Holy Spirit said, let's pray. So I said, all right. I said, brother, let's say a word of prayer. When I said these, these words, let's, let's have a word of prayer, the brother looked at me like I was saying, let's go find these two Caucasian people and rob them and get your stuff back. So he looked at me like I was crazy. <clears throat> so when I saw his reaction, I said, all right, it's time for me to share this brother my testimony. So I took out my new boarding pass. I took out my old boarding pass. <clears throat> and I said, brother, let me show you what happened two days. And I explained to him my testimony, and next thing he was like, what? I said, yes, brother. I said, because of prayer. He said, okay, okay, let's have a word of prayer. So we knelt down, and I prayed. I said, dear father, I said, please, Lord, intervene in this matter right now. I said, Lord, if these Caucasian people have a good heart, let them take this brother luggage and, and, and bag he had, 
to the lost and found. If they don't, please stop them, dear Lord, that they'll enter the plane. So after I finished praying, we got up. Two officers walked by. I stopped them. I said, hey, we have a situation here, officer. This brother wants to use the restroom. He left his, uh, his um, carry-on luggage here. Two Caucasian people stole it and took it. Is the camera right there? Can you check it? Can you stop them? I said, well, go to the police station on the second floor. I said, all right, let's do that. <laughs> so I said, brother, let's go. I'm coming with you. We're going down to the police station. So while we're walking, I could look, I'm looking at the brother. He feel discouraged. He don't know what to do. He's scratching his head. He has no money. And I looked at him. I said, brother, firmly, I looked at the brother. I said, brother, let me tell you this. Our prayer is answered. And you know what thing, my brother? It was so weird because I was like, what? Well, where did um, this firmness come from? <laughs> I'm telling this brother, hey, <laughs> our prayer is answered. And I was serious with this brother. I was really serious about it. And then so after we got to the second floor, we approached the police station. They was like, how may we help you guys? I explained to them the situation. And they was like, oh, yeah. Two Caucasian people came there and said that, Somebody left their luggage and their bag upstairs. <laughs> and then it was so funny because, remember, when I prayed, I said, Lord, if these two Caucasian people have a good heart, let them bring these two, uh, the brother item to the lost and found or police station. And when this brother heard what the police officer said, that two Caucasian people came to the police station and said that somebody left their carry-on luggage in a bag upstairs. And I looked over, I looked at the brother. His jaw dropped. Tears ran down his eyes. He started crying like a baby. He couldn't believe what the officer just said. And I was like, thank you, officer. Thank you. So where can we get um, his item? Where can we get his um, bag? He said, go to the first floor to the lost and found. I said, all right. So when we left there, the brother was crying and crying. I said, brother, I told you the Lord is going to answer you, uh, our prayer. I said, let's go to lost and found. So when we got to the lost and found, I explained to him the situation. And then when he looked over the table, he saw his luggage. He said, there go my luggage. There go my bag. And then he had to give his information to the lost and found people. And when he said, okay, this is your bag. He got it back. He was so happy that he cried so hard. And the people that was working in lost and found were saying, hey, what happened? Why are you crying? And he says, because of this brother if this brother never prayed, I would not lost find my, I would not find my bag mm. that has my important passport and document in there. Mm. So after that, we walk upstairs. <laughs> we was rejoicing. He was so happy, and we was talking about Jesus. So we walked when we got up to the third floor, <laughs> and you know, in, in, in Dubai Airport, you have a lot of nationality because it's like a central point where people have to connect flight to go to the western side or to the eastern side of, of the country. And there was a lot of African people there, Middle Eastern people and Asian people. And he's, he's having a um, carry-on luggage in his hand and in the bag. Next thing you know, he just dropped it again and, and ran off. I'm like, brother, are you going to do this again? So I'm like, where's he going? Where's he running to? His family's here or what? Next thing you know, this brother went to air all his African people. He explained to them what happened. I mean, he was shouting, said, yo, if, man, I, I, I lost my luggage. This brother prayed, and God answered my prayer. I mean, he went to every African people and started telling them the situation. That's and then so I took his, um, his luggage. I went on to the church, sat down, and next thing you know, they all came to me, looked at me, and said, man, by the grace of God, because of your prayer, he got his luggage. I said, to God be the glory. So I realized that God had me there for two days, <laughs> two days for this brother to have faith. And I only got to share the message with them, too. So God had me two days for this soul, so for that brother. So that was really a, a testimony, a trial, but it was a blessing. You know, when Jesus healed people, and a lot of times they would run off and tell others about the experience that they had. Oh, yes. And um, now with this brother, can you imagine when Jesus comes and we're going home and you see that brother going home with you? <laughs> Man, I'm telling you. <laughs> that <laughs> trip. <laughs> can you imagine? And, and I'm going to tell you something else, too. This is why I say this all the time. By God's grace, this brother, because of this, this experience and, and, and if he keeps studying, will make it into the kingdom. And if he makes it into the kingdom... 
Every time he sees you, anywhere in the universe, throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity, he can, he'll turn over to you and say thank you for the ceaseless ages of eternity. Indeed, amen. Indeed. Those two days, it's nothing compared to the ceaseless ages of eternity. I'm telling you, man. Let me ask you this question. When you went to help him, uh, were you in danger? I mean, how were you in danger of missing your flight? Because did you, uh, how long was your flight? How long were you, did you have to wait at that gate? A day or? Mm, I had to wait for like, probably like eight hours, nine hours. So it, it, my flight was going to leave the, um, the morning, uh, wait, the morning, gotcha. the evening. Yeah. Okay. So I, I was good. I, I was okay. Yeah. I was not going to miss my flight. Yes. Okay. So let me ask you this question now. Now that you have been through this experience, and I mean, you went through what you went through over there in Nepal, and now you're in this Dubai airport, and you're going through all that you're going through. The next time that you're in a crisis, do you see yourself handling it differently? Other than the prayer, the prayer you can't you can't change. That has to be um, um, that has to remain no matter what you're doing. In good times and bad times, we need to keep praying, 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 praying. I, I get, get that. that. Yeah. But do you think this experience that you just went through is going to increase your faith for the, the next time you may end up in a crisis? You know, it's funny you said that because it did happen again after I left India. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, my. Wait, wait, wait. You, yeah. it, it happened after, again? After Yes. Uh, the same year. Because I was in Nepal in March, and I was in India in, I think, September. The same year, I think two years, I think two years ago, yes. The same year it happened, and my faith was tested. But I had faith in God. It was so funny because I was in wavering. I was just praying to God and praying to God, and God just opened the door. But yes, it was tested again. <laughs> it was my brother. Well, I tell you what, we have we have eight minutes. I I, I could bring you back, and we can do another uh, interview. But we do have eight minutes. If you want to give me a synops a synopsis of what happened in India. Um, before we go to break. Okay. Yes. What happened with India was um, the three people or the four people that got <clears throat> that got baptized in Nepal, they were from India, converted to Christians. The four, the three Hindu and one um Buddhist, they they wanted me to come to India to share the gospel. <clears throat> so God opened the door for me to go to India. So I arrived in India. I shared the gospel there, and after that day, I had to go to um Socket, um New Delhi. That's the capital of um of India. You have Old Delhi and New Delhi. So while I was there, I brought some materials with me. Uh, Step to Christ, National Sunday Law, and DVDs of the Forerunner, uh, Jay-Z Deception and um, Leopard Vision and the one with the homosexual. So <clears throat> I said, Lord, while I'm there, I want to share the gospel. Um, so <clears throat> one Friday night, I think it was like about 9 o'clock in, in, in the evening. It was like Sabbath. So I said, alright, Lord, I'm going out there. I'm going to share the truth. It's billions of people in India, especially in the capital, I'm going to do your work. So I took my luggage with all the books and DVDs. I went downstairs. I told the night manager, I'm sharing the gospel. He said, okay. So I went in front of the hotel under a tree. And I was surprised to see the street was empty. I was like, what's going on? This is India. Traffic, excuse me, traffic is always jammed, even in the evening, morning, afternoon. I said, what's going on, Lord? Mm. So I prayed, I prayed. I said, Lord, please open the door. Send some people. Flood the street. Next thing you know, a minute later, I see a young guy running his bike. I said, hey, buddy, come here, come here. He made a U-turn. I said, hey, do you love, these, do you love um, American music or, you know, DVDs? Or do you, do you know Jay-Z? He said, yeah, I love Jay-Z. I said, this is a free DVD about Jay-Z, Jay-Z Deception. He said, free? Yeah, from America. I mean, this brother was so happy, like I gave him a, a million dollars in his hand. <laughs> and next thing you know, the brother got on his phone. He called all his friends. His friends called their friends. They called their friends. The next thing you know, I looked down the street. I looked the other street. I looked down the other street. Young people start running down the street. I was like, oh, boy, what is happening? And I was like, this is the guy with the DVD. And next thing you know, the street was flooded with vehicles and people and taxi. I'm like, oh, my goodness, Lord. I said, okay, Lord. I'm passing out DVDs. I mean, people just crowding me. 
I'm blocking the streets. I'm blocking the uh, the road. People don't know what's going on. It came to the point that police had to come out there, security had to come out there, even some soldiers had to come out there. Now, what is the big commotion? What is going on? Is a riot? What's going on? And while I was talking in Hindi, every hundred thousand hand pointed at me. So the police and the soldier came to me. They approached oh me. They said, "What are you doing?" I said, "I'm just passing out free books and DVDs." DVDs? Where are you from? I'm from America. So what are you doing here? I'm passing out um, free books. About what? About Jesus Christ. He died for all of us. For uh, um, he died for, um, for all of us here in India and, and all over the world. He said, what do you mean? I said, Jesus died for you and I. He paid the penalty. He died for you, my brother. Not the statue over there with a the big belly that God knows, Jesus. <laughs> and then he looked at me and he started laughing and said, Jesus? I said, yes, brother. The one that created you, the one that gave you the breath, that gave you the position to be a soldier, that gave you life every day. And it hit him so hard. And he said, is it free? I said, yes. He said, why is it free? I said, salvation is free. I said, it's free, without a cost. And he said, the DVD? Yeah. I said, do you speak English? He said, yeah, you're in English. He said, yes, I read good English. I said, this book is free for you, Step to Christ and National Sunday Law. He said, thank you, brother. And next thing you know, he told the soldiers, come get some free books and DVDs. And the police <laughs> came, the soldiers came. Oh, every boy. taxi man stopped. They jumped out the vehicle. The customer was so mad because it was, they told me it was over like almost 100,000 people on the street. And I, I only had like, what, 2,500, 3,000 DVDs or 2,000 books each. And people were fighting for the books. And it came to the point that it was Muslims that was there. It was like a business down the street. It was having an uh, evening business. And when I looked over my right, uh, right shoulder, I saw two Muslims walking, wearing a nice suit, covering their head. I realized they were Muslims. And one of them approached me and said, um, yes, we're hearing this big commotion that you're giving out free books and DVDs. Can we get some? Oh, can, we get, can we get some books? I said, yes. And I said, what's this book about? I said, it's about Jesus, who came to die for you, my brother. You're God, your father that made you. He said, thank you. Can I give it to my workers? Sure. Let them come down. They came down. They got free books and DVDs. And, I mean, it was like I was giving out hot food, like I was giving money. I mean, people were so happy. I mean, taxi guy, people stopped, they blocked the road. I was to the point like, Lord, you should provide me hundreds of thousands of DVDs and books. But it was to the point that everything ran out. It was done. I went back to the hotel. The night manager heard about what happened. He was like, man, this is crazy, brother. This has never happened before. I said, to God be the glory. So um, when I was in, the, um, in, in my room, I told the night manager, I'm going upstairs. I'm going to sleep. It was like 1 o'clock in the morning. I'm tired. So while I was there, long story short, the manager was knocked out. Two Muslims approached the hotel, and he thought that they were going to check in. So he was knocked out sleeping, so they woke him up, so, you know, his brain all fuzzy. He's trying to get himself together. And they were saying that they were going to visit three, room 302. That's my room in the third floor, room 302. So... He said, all right, put your name right here. I'm going to call Sam that you're coming to visit him. And he called me in my room, but I was sleeping. Next thing you know, he told him to go upstairs. After he went upstairs in the elevator, he's sitting down. He's getting himself back together. He's like, he realized, hold on for a second. There are two Muslims. They have knife on them. Why are they going to see Sam in, in room 302? So he called me, called me, called me on the, um, the, the room uh, phone. I didn't answer. I was sleeping. He called the other night manager to come in because he realized that these Muslims were about to kill me. So next thing you know, he called the people that was working in the kitchen and said, yo, I need your help. No one answered the phone. He called the police. The police never answered the phone. He didn't know what to do. He looked at the, um, the camera monitor, the TV monitor camera. He realized that they haven't got to the third floor yet. He didn't know what to do. He said, man, I have to go save this brother. They're going to kill him. Next thing you know, he looked at the TV monitor again. He saw them coming out of the elevator door. And my room, my room door, my room is adjacent to the elevator door. So when he saw these two guys leaving the elevator door, about to um, come into my room, he panicked. But then after that, he, before he left to run upstairs to help me and save me, he looked again at a TV monitor camera. He realized he saw a third person. Now, this person 
He told me that this person was so tall that his body covered the camera. So he's definitely panicked. So he ran upstairs. After he ran upstairs, he heard the elevator door. So he thought it was the second floor, but he looked down. It was the first floor. He saw the two Muslim guys running out. So he hollered at him and said, hey, stop. He ran downstairs. He said, why are you guys going to visit um, room 302, see me a room? What was the purpose? Where's the third guy? And then the two Muslims told him that that tall guy said 302 is his room. He said, no, no, no. It's Simeon room. How can it be his room? So he just ran upstairs. He ran to the third floor. I mean, this brother kicked my door, banged my door. He woke me up. I opened up and said, brother, what happened? Is it a protest? What was going on? Are they coming here to kill me? Should I jump down the balcony like Paul did? What happened, brother? He said, no, 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 no. What was the, what was the tall guy? I said, what tall guy? He came into my room. He went under my bed. He went to the bath. They went to my closet. They went on the balcony. I said, brother, what are you talking about? He said, they were coming to kill you. I said, who? The, the three, three Muslims. I saw two of them. They came in. Another one was right here. I saw him in the camera. But he covered the camera. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I said, what are you talking about? And next thing you know, the Holy Spirit just put everything to my mind. I started laughing. I said, brother, let me tell you tomorrow morning, man. Don't worry. Everything is okay. So the next morning, I went downstairs. I saw him. I told him. I said, my brother, though you saw these two Muslims was trying to kill me, God sent an angel in human form to tell these two Muslims that 302 is his room. You know what I mean? I but we know that 302 is my room. But God's in the angel in human form to tell them that 302 is his room, that Simeon is not here. So that's why the two Muslim guys came down and said to him that 302 is not Simeon's room. So God's in the angel in human form to protect me. <laughs> Have yeah. mercy. Have mercy. Have mercy. You know, I, you know, I didn't even... <laughs> When you told me something else happened in India, I didn't know if there was going to even be this strong of a story. But my goodness. Oh, um, yeah. All right. So I'm still kind of taking this in. <laughs> I'm still taking it in. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. So listen, Brother Simeon, what we're going to do, we're going to, we're going to bring you back and we're going to do some more talking and more sharing. Okay. Because, because we got to help as many people as we possibly can around the world. Yes. Okay. The nice thing is that we can we can do that around the world without having to get on a plane. Sometimes we do get on a plane to 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 talk to people and pass out books and so forth. But right now we're going to do it from where we are, and um and speak to people. And listen, I want I want to thank you for taking time. Why don't you just say a word of prayer right now? And oh, yeah. normally, and then we're going to break. Normally, I, because of the we're kind of behind. Um, time, so I don't know if we can go into the devotional, but say a word of prayer, and then, in fact, hit, let's do this. Give me any final comments you would like to make, and then say a word of prayer, and then we'll go into break. Mm -hmm. Okay, the comment I want to say right now is, um, you know, brothers and sisters, for you to hear this testimony, we have to have faith in Jesus, trust in Jesus. You know, when we do his work, we know that anything could happen to us. But, you know, the Lord is always with us. He always will protect us. And we have to trust in him. And, yes, we all know that the gospel has to be preached to every kindred nation of tongue. But we have to trust in God. We have to, brothers and sisters, because, you know, I went there by myself. I went to India by myself. But not only by myself, God was with me. The angels was with me. So I just want to encourage everybody to go forward. If God is calling you to do a work, Go by faith. Trust in him. And not only that, consecrate yourself. Get closer to Jesus because we know that we're going to a different field. And these fields are the enemy turf and ground. So don't be weary. It's not going to be easy. But God is always there next to us to open the door. So we just have to trust in him and go forward by faith. Amen. Amen. Would you say a word of prayer for us? Sure. <clears throat> there, Father God, I just want to give you thanks, Lord, for this wonderful opportunity to be on this um, radio station with my dear brother. It's been a blessing, Lord, because you're the one that permit me to go through this situation in Nepal and India because it's a testimony and encouragement to share to the brethren all over the world that listen to the station that is probably scared to do your work, that I have no mm. encouragement or lack of faith. But dear Lord, as a young man like me, sincere, willing to go out there to see that you prepared the way, you provide the way. Yes, it wasn't easy. But, Lord, I had faith in you. 
Because though I was stuck in these countries, only you, Lord, I knew. And you opened the door. So there, Father God, yes. let this testimony be encouraged to everybody because you get the honor, you get the praise. And help us all, Lord, to realize, Lord, you're always with us. You will never forsake us there, Father God. So help us, Lord, that during this new year that we're in right now, it's time for us to prepare ourselves. This is preparation time to get closer to you. It's prepared to get, uh, 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 to have your image, your character in us. It's prepared to be about your business, our Father business. So please, dear Lord, help us, dear Father God. Help us to understand. Open our eyes, Lord, that we have the spiritual eyes have to see. And help us to live by faith. Help us to trust in you, Lord. Not to complain, not to whine. Yes, it's a, it's a, it's a sinful nature. But, Lord, we must know the things that you have done for us over the years, you are the same God. So thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be on this, um, my brother radio station to share my testimony, Lord, your testimony, to encourage people all over the world to go forward. Because we all know, Lord, that you're with us because we're doing your work to share the gospel, to pave the way, to give the light, to be light bearers that you could come. We thank you, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. 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 Thank you so much, brother, for um, spending time with us and for being part of our family and, and, we, and, and being a part of the New Jerusalem family, most importantly. I want to tell the listeners that you can share this testimony tonight. It will air again at 1030 Eastern. Tonight at 1030 Eastern, uh, get people on the line so that they can hear this. You know, let let them download the app, or they go. They can go to swmradio.com. But um, let they need to hear this testimony, and we need to start getting ready for what is about to happen on this earth. We thank you so much for being with us this morning. We're going to go into break right now. We won't have a devotional because of the time, but uh, we'll come back after the break with Pastor Bowen. He will give us a daily uh, briefing and the morning manna. God bless you and thank you so much for being a part of SWM Radio.